All right, well, good morning, church. It's great to see you guys, and it's good to hear you as well. Very good singing. Um, I love to be able to sing and worship together uh, with my church family and and just to to hear the Lord's name being proclaimed uh, above all else. Sometimes we go throughout our week, and I think that the the voices that we hear can sometimes be discouraging, um, whether it's through the news media or whether it's through events that are happening in our own lives. Um, sometimes it just, um, it just things get hard, and it's nice to be able to come into uh, the house of the Lord, into a church, and be able to have a unity of spirit with other believers, and be able to call out to God, and to be able to block out all the noise, and to be able to block out all those other voices that might be vying for our attention, and to say, God, I love you. God, thank you for what you have done in my life. Thank you for who you are. Help me to trust you. Help me to move forward. God, help me to live for you in a way that honors you in all that I say and all that I do. Um, man, I just, I just love that. I love the gift of the church, and, um, and I love that we are able uh, to be beneficiaries of, of these wonderful things that God has given us um, because of his goodness and grace. This morning, we are in the second part of a four-part series that I'm calling Devoted. And this series is actually a study of Romans chapter 12, uh, but it also has a very specific emphasis, and that's where that title of Devoted comes in. Um, Last week, I kind of explained the thought process um, behind this series and the title itself, looking at the fact that so often it it feels like we're, we're on a roller coaster, that we're on a roller coaster ride when it comes to our faith. We experience a moment of of great spiritual excitement, uh, maybe great spiritual growth, this closeness to the Lord, but then you turn around and then life throws you that curveball and it seems like God is so far away, and then we hit another spiritual high and then another curveball, and we're just up and down, we're up and down, and the emotional effect, uh, the spiritual effect that it takes on us can sometimes leave us confused and wondering, God, what are you doing? God, are you there? Um, why, why can't I find this consistency in my life? Why, why is there so, much, so many ups and downs? At least in, in my life, in my experience, in dealing with so many other people, that that is a common thing. And so what do we do about that? Is that just, do we have to, to uh, relegate ourselves to that's just the way that life is? Or is there something different? Is there something better? Is there another, another perspective? Is there something different that God has for us? And I believe that the answer to that question is that, yes, there is something different that God has for us, and that is a consistent life that is devoted to Christ, okay, that is uh, going forward on a trajectory that has a whole lot less ups and downs. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to experience difficulty and that not we're, we're not going to experience those highs, okay, because we are. We're going to experience both highs and lows, but, okay, to be able to level that out and to have a consistency in our life is what the world desperately needs to see and what we desperately, I believe, want in our lives. Okay? If you're honest, don't you want a life that is consistent? A life that has focus, meaning, direction, and intentionality? And something that is not determined upon your circumstances and situations around you? I know I do. I would love that consistency. That's what I want. That's what I desire. And so this series is going to help us to see some key elements that keep us focused. That can help us be more completely, more wholly devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our world today seems to pursue the bigger and the better, right? The more extreme, whether it's through entertainment or whether it's through experience, the motto of the day seems to be entertain me. Show me something that's going to wow me, all right? And the bigger it is, the better it is, the more spectacular it is, the more excited we get. But as soon as that excitement wears off, we're looking for the next big thing, okay? And unfortunately, as Christians, we are not immune to this type of um, seeking after the next big thing. But the question we have to ask, is that the way that the Christian life really should look? Okay? Are we supposed to be looking for the next big thing, the next opportunity to be wowed? Or again, is there perhaps something different? And again, I believe that yes, there is something different, something more. So this series is about that something more. This series is about a pursuit of consistency. How can I be more devoted to the one who gave all so that I could be forgiven of sin and free from its guilt and shame? How can I be more devoted to Christ? Last week we took our first steps to to better understanding this this level of consistency 
and how devotion to Christ um, works in a practical sense. We looked at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and we see that God is telling us that it is both logical and reasonable that we would commit our lives to him as an act of worship. And that is just a literal reading of the text. That God says, as a result of who I am, as a result of what I have done for you, and we look back at the last verse of Romans chapter 11, that our result is both logical and reasonable that we would worship God with the entirety of our being, that we would give of ourselves our entire lives. And it was in that last week where we saw this, our big idea, the understanding that being fully devoted to Christ means I am willing to worship him with everything I have. Okay? And so that's the foundation, that if we get that in our mind and then we break apart what that looks like, it should be able to help us to move forward and actual practical application of, these, of this truth, okay, and of the other truths that we will be seeing from, directly from the Word of God, that we need to worship with everything that we have. But here's the deal. We also saw that true devotion to the Lord can only come about by a transformation of the mind, okay? And that's the first part of real life change. We talked about the three levels of life change last week, the mind, the heart, and the hands, okay, so you can think of it as head, heart, hands, and I think that that's incredibly important because that's going to apply to any area where you're needing to change. You have to think right, okay? You have to think rightly, and so you have to have the correct information. Then you have to take that information and, and base, base what you're doing upon it. It has to become a, a heart belief, not just I understand it and I know it. You have to be convinced and convicted that this is what I need to pursue, okay? And that's the heart issue. And then you have to take action. That's of the hands. And so anything that we're talking about in this series or anything really that you're dealing with where you know God is saying this has to change, it's going to go through that process. Truth entering the mind, being, being accepted by the heart, a conviction that yes, this is right, and I'm going to commit myself to that, and then I'm going to take action through my hands, head, heart, and hands. And so that, that, that's what we have to deal with. And that brings us to where we are this week as we continue looking at how Romans 12 informs us concerning this devotion to the Lord, how that our life can be changed and can be transformed to one that is more consistent and more level so that the world, when it looks at us, they don't just see it's like, wow, they are, they're like bipolar from one extreme to the other, that no matter what happens through the good and the bad, that they are trusting in, in something. And that's something ultimately is God, is, is found in Christ. And so as we did last week, I'd like to start this morning by reading the entirety of Romans 12. I want us to make sure that as we go through this, we're getting an understanding of the context. Because all these verses work together. Even though you're going to find some separate themes, some very clearly distinct themes, they're all working together to give us this big picture. And so I, I think we need to read it uh, again, and then we're going to narrow our focus today on verses 3 through 8. And so as we get to verses 3 through 8, kind of just kind of hone in and really uh, think through what it is that's being said there. And so if you've got a Bible or Bible app, go ahead and open that with me if you haven't already done so to Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to read again verses 1 through 21, but we're going to narrow our attention on verses 3 through 8. Okay? The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, remember that therefore is the result of what took place at the very end of Romans chapter 11, talking about who God is, what he has done. Paul's saying, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And in other translations will say, which is your spiritual act of worship, okay, or your act of worship. And then the Bible says, and do not be conformed to this world. Okay, so there it's identifying the problems of this world, the bigger, the better, the highs, the lows. So don't conform yourself to the way that, that's, that the world says it's supposed to be. Okay? Do not conform, be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So it's starting, talking, it starts with the head. It okay? starts with what we believe. Now pay particular attention to the next six verses. Verse 3. For I say... Through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches, in teaching. He who exhorts, in exhortation. He who gives, with liberality. 
He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Again, those are the main verses we're dealing with, verses 3 through 8. Now, verse 9, he continues, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Uh, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, as we dig further into this chapter, into Romans 12 this morning, let's remember that the focal point is devotion to Christ. And how can I, asking the question of how can I personally be more focused, more consistent, and more devoted in my Christian faith? So this is the assumption that you already know Christ, that you have placed faith in him, okay, but you're on the roller coaster ride, but you're experiencing the ups and downs, and you would like to see more consistency in your Christian walk. That's the assumption that's there, okay? So let's start by looking in particular at verse number three. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. So what are we dealing with here? What, are, what, what characteristic of life that, that we can fall into are we dealing with? We're dealing with pride, right? Not to think of yourself more highly than you should. So this area of, of pride. Pride is a sin of, of both destruction and deceit, okay? And it has the power to derail us from a life of faithfulness and devotion to the Lord. Okay, and we're going to see that this morning, that pride has the power to really throw us off course from where God would want us to be. When you look at, at your own situation and the times where you really feel like you're inconsistent in your own spiritual walk, is there an element of pride that you can identify? I just want you to think about those times when it seems like up and down and up and down. Can you look back and think of, of reasons or a correlation between that up and down and pride. Okay. I know that's a weird question. You probably have never thought about that before, about how pride might be related to, to the ups and downs of, uh, that we experience or that we, that we kind of bring into that picture. Okay. Think about it this way. It might take the form of self-sufficiency. Okay. I can do this. I can get through that okay, when you're in the valley. right? So in the down part, you're like, hey, I got this. Okay, I can handle it. I'm tough. I'm strong. I'm smart. I'm whatever. I can get through this. I'm resilient. I'm self-sufficient. No problem. I got it. Okay? And the whole time that you're facing that obstacle, you're on that down part, you're facing this obstacle, that which God wants you to overcome. He wants you to get through that. Okay? But during that time, you're not admitting that you might actually need help. During that time, you're like, I, I got this. The self-sufficiency side. When actually God wants you to say, God, I need you to get me through this, okay? his work in my life. Not, not that I need the strength to do it. You do, but God's going to have to bring you through it. Does that make sense? So self-sufficiency, sometimes that can contribute to a lot of the roller coaster, and that's, that's pride. God, I, I don't really need you. You've given me these things, but I can do this. I've got it. I can handle this. Okay? Maybe you can relate to that example. I know I've been there before. Okay, God, I got this. Okay, and I just kind of leave him out of the equation entirely. And so I got this. Perhaps, though, for you, pride takes a little different form. Perhaps it looks a little bit more like superiority masked in spiritual maturity. This is a dangerous one, and I might step on toes, maybe, probably, absolutely my own first. Okay, think about this, guys. Okay, S- superiority masked in spiritual maturity. All right? You've been a Christian for a number of years. Say so you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 
maybe 50 years, right? So you've been a believer for a long time. Maybe, maybe even you're just a college student now, but you, you're a Christian as a kid, and so like all your life, you, you, you've, just, you've known Christianity, you've been in church, and, and you've grown, and you are, uh, you, you're really maturing in Christ, and so you, you have this level of spiritual maturity. You've heard thousands of sermons, literally, okay? I mean, if you've been a Christian for any number of years, um, there's, you're going to just start accumulating, I mean, just tons and tons of information. You've read the Bible, Okay, maybe you've read it from cover to cover multiple times. Um, I mean, and you've, you've had so much information poured into you. You've been there. You've done that. You've bought the T-shirt, right? Okay, almost anything that, that is of Christian nature, you, you've experienced it. Okay, you've been on the mission trip. You've seen, the, you've seen it all. And so those things uh, of, the, of the Christian life, of, of what Christianity looks like in our Western culture, you're so comfortable with, you know it, you, you, you have this, this, this feeling of, yeah, I am spiritually mature, and, and I'm not saying that you're not, okay? I'm saying what might be happening is sometimes superiority can be masked in spiritual maturity, all right? You know what's right, and so therefore you make moral decisions, you make good decisions, um, and so it, it often results in, in good things in your life, uh, and for the most part, things are just, are, are good. Maybe you are one that has a, a level of consistency, and man, and you're excited about that, and, and maybe you're really proud, say it, proud of that, okay? And so there's th- this, this feeling that you've got it all together. Um, and in fact, compared to most people, you're doing pretty good. And you kind of look around, and you're like, man, wow, I'm doing, doing okay. okay I, I've got this, this together. And and you think, man, I, I'm glad I, I'm not like them, okay? I'm glad I'm not like that. And you begin to put yourself in the you versus them category. And you're like, I feel pity and I feel sorry for it. And that's, there's, there's a level of compassion. I get that, okay? As a Christian, we need to be compassionate upon those who, whose lives are being destroyed by sin, whether it's their own or the effects of the sin of others. And so to a level of compassion. But we start separating ourselves from other people. Man, I'm glad I'm not like them. But be careful, because this is a tricky one. Because as you grow in Christ, these things are going to be real. They're going to be tangible. They're going to be positive things, okay? And while it's good to be, to be able to be thankful for what God has done in your life and to be where you are and thankful that what God has saved you from, you're actually walking that very, very fine line. In fact, Jesus spoke to this in Luke chapter 18. Let's actually read that account, because I think this is important as we talk about pride, now, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Apostle Paul says, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. And you think, well, that's, that's not an issue. I don't have an issue with that. Maybe we do, and we're not realizing it. Let's read that account. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. And these are the words of Jesus. And he's giving us a parable. And so it's a story to illustrate a real truth. All right? And so he's, he, he gives us... Uh, a, a, a story, a fictional account, if you would, but it is illustrative of reality. So this could be happening in your church, in, in their time, in your synagogue, okay? And so Jesus is, is telling this, this parable, this story. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, Okay, so first of all, the Pharisee is a very religious individual. He knows the Bible. He has memorized the Bible. He's quoted the Bible. He's moral. In fact, he's listed out so many things that he does or does not do that, that he's, he's, he's never going to sin. I mean, that's what he's thinking, okay? And so he's got all of this stuff together. And so the Pharisee prays to God, and he, he prays this way. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector, And so he observes a tax collector over here. He says, I I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So there's two different things. The Pharisee says, I'm glad I'm not like this other guy over here, this tax collector. He says, I'm fasting. I'm giving of everything that I've got. He says, but then there's the tax collector afar off who wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven because he recognizes his own sin. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus' response in this, in telling this story, he says, I tell you, this man, referring to the tax collector, the one who says, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus, those are... 
that's, that's tough. And I think what's interesting about this parable is that Jesus specifically told this parable at this place and this time because he was dealing with a group of people who were trusting in themselves that they were righteous and looking down on others. It's the whole reason he told the parable. He knows the hearts. He knows the intent of man. And he knows that the people he's talking to are struggling with this issue of pride and this air of superiority. How do we know that? Because verse 9, the verse right prior to that parable says this. It says, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Okay? So they had this air of superiority. They're looking down their noses at everybody else and they're saying, man, I am glad that I am not like them. Okay? Makes sense? The whole reason he told the parable is because there was an issue of pride in the heart that they didn't realize. They thought that they were superior. They thought that they were spiritually mature and it ended up resulting in pride okay and that's how it's so defeat deceitful okay is it good to memorize scripture absolutely is it good to fast absolutely i mean is it good to pray all of the things that the pharisee was doing are good things are they not yeah yes and amen absolutely they're good things but what he didn't do was to guard his heart and to keep him to ask god keep me humble all right help me to follow your will and your way, and to have your spirit as well, okay? the spirit of God. That's how pride can be so deceitful. It, lo- it masks or raids itself as spiritual maturity at times, that I've arrived, and man, I'm glad I'm not like them. Okay? Pride makes you forget that you too are simply a sinner saved by grace. Sometimes we've got to be reminded of that fact, guys, that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. What did Paul write there at the beginning of verse 3 when he warned about pride? What was the first part he said? He says, for I say through the grace given to me. He says, the only way that I can say these words is because I received the grace of God himself. It's by grace. It's not me. It's not because I'm a better person. It's not because I'm good. He says, I can write to you about this issue of pride because I have received grace, the grace of God. I am what I am and who I am solely by the grace of God. Can you say that? I am what I am, and I am who I am solely by the grace of God. You know, pride makes you forget that. <laughs> pride makes you forget that you are who you are, and you, you are experiencing what you're experiencing just because of God's grace. <laughs> it's deceitful. And when we forget about God's grace and we forget about His goodness, we start thinking that we're the answer. That we're hot stuff. And before you know it, I'm veering off the path of devotion to Christ and consistent spiritual growth and wallowing in the muck and mire of pride and superiority. Hmm. Stay there long enough and you find yourself in trouble. Because not only pride is deceitful, but I also said it's destructive, right? I said it has a two-pronged attack. Destruction and deceit. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It will destroy. You stay in that place, you're going to destroy yourself and everybody around you. Did Jesus really have many good things to say about those Pharisees? Not just in that context, but as a whole? No. Because they were destroying everything. They were destroying themselves. They were destroying people's concept of, 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 of faith, thinking that it was all this religious act and all this outward show. The Pharisees were wreaking havoc with the lives of people. Pride. James chapter 4 and verse 6 says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So there it is again, pride and grace. Same thing you see in Romans 12, 3. Pride and grace. It's hard to be devoted to Christ when God himself is resisting you, right? I mean, just think about it. Can you be devoted to Christ if God himself is resisting you? That's what the Bible says. God resists the proud, but it's to the humble that he gives grace. A faithful Christian and a prideful Christian can never be one and the same. You can't. A devoted Christian and a prideful Christian, those two things, they don't, they don't work. Okay? You can't be the same. That cannot happen. In fact, in our main text of Romans 12, Paul writes in verse 16 that the Christian is not to be wise in his or her own opinions. In other words, we are not to be prideful. He comes right back around to it near the end of that text. 
He says, do not be wise in your own opinion. And that is sandwiched with all the other stuff in between that we're, talking, that we're going to talk about in the rest of today and then next week. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Watch out for pride. Okay? What happens? It knows the dangers of pride. Okay? When we look at, at, at pride and the answer to the problem of pride within the context of Romans 12, we have to understand that it knows the dangers of pride. Right? The answer is this. The fact that God doesn't want for pride to have any part of our lives has to be absorbed. <laughs> we have to understand that. That is the head knowledge that we have to do in order to overcome this pride. Okay? We have to understand okay, its danger and then understand that God doesn't want, it, doesn't want that to be a part of us. That he wants that to be far, far from us. And when we see it, to run from it, to ask him for the, for the strength to live in, in, in humility. Okay, the disciples had a real problem with that. You just go back and look at the Gospels. And so the head knowledge, pride is destructive. God doesn't want it to be a part of my life. Then you've got to do something with that knowledge so that it becomes that which motivates us, okay? that which is of the heart. So I know it. I know pride is bad. I know pride should not be in my life. Then I've got to bring, bring that into a point of conviction. And what we're supposed to do with that knowledge is actually quite interesting as you look at verses 4 through 8. So we receive that knowledge, and then verses 4 through 8 give us the practical application of the conviction as well as the action of the hands. All right? So what does Paul say will help overcome the issue of pride and help us live consistently within this context? Right? He says, working together within the body of Christ. Interesting. Okay, we're going to have to piece all of this together. Paul's dealing with pride, and he says that the answer is to work together within the body of Christ. Now, this is actually one of my favorite passages of Scripture that deals with the importance of the nature of the church, okay? Because this is, this is an incredibly important passage for all believers, whether you're a new believer or whether you've been a Christian for a long time, to understand how we are to function within a church body, all right? This passage has a lot, a lot of information. And so this is one of my, my favorite, uh, favorite parts, one of my favorite passages, um, in fact, this is uh, one of the, the main components when we do a new members class. We do that a couple times a year as new people are coming into the church to be able to explain who we are, what we believe, and why we believe these things. This passage in Romans 12, uh, as well as 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, are, are some of the main passages we deal with. In fact, I spend a whole day talking about this passage in conjunction with 1 Corinthians 12 and why it's important and why, why every single Christian who wants to be a part of the local church needs to understand it and what the practical outworkings of it is. Um, and so we see that, that this gives us um, a big picture um, that the church consists of, of a body. That's the analogy that's being given. And that each Christian has a different function, which is the word that's used there in verse number four, that all Christians have a different function within the body. Um, but we also have to understand that as we are individuals within the body, together we make up the body, showing a beautiful picture of unity through diversity of gifts, functions, and abilities. And so uh, we see that there is unity through the diverse functions and diverse giftings of people in the church. Right? Now, just go ahead and, and throw out there, we're going to have a new members class here in a few weeks. So if you'd be interested in being a part of that and digging deeper into Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, talk to me uh, because we want to set that up and uh, get that timed out. It's a five-week class uh, that we'll go through. And so if you are new to the church, we invite you to be a part of that. All right. Um, as we look at, at this passage, though, in particular, back in Romans 12, chapter 12, uh, we see that God uses our different talents and abilities and giftings for his glory and for his purpose. Let me give you an example. Um, take an example for, for Braden and myself, Braden and me. Um, Braden's here on staff with us. He's the one that's giving the announcements and different things. Uh, Braden and I are very different from one another. Um, we're of a different generation, we have different interests, we have different abilities. Okay, there's on the spectrum of very much alike versus very much different. We're, we're definitely closer to that very much different side. Okay, <laughs> we just are. But I love Braden. Okay, Braden is, is awesome. But outside of the church, if it were not for the context of the church, and if it were not for the fact of being a Christian, chances are Braden and I would not be best buddies and best friends. Okay, I'm sorry, Braden, but that's just probably not going to happen outside of the context of the church because our interests are so different and generationally we're not in that same place in life. But we are Christians, 
And we are in the same church together. We are part of the body of Christ. And because of that, there is a commonality that Braden and I have that transcends all of our differences and really brings us together, providing greater unity than just a common interest could ever have. Okay? If, if I liked dinosaurs as much as Braden, I mean, we would have a ton of common interest, all right? But that still doesn't mean that we, are, we have unity. But because of what Christ has done and his Holy Spirit working in both of our lives, that commonality transcends his interest in dinosaurs and my interest in basketball, all right? It's just hugely, hugely different. And so instead of our differences being a bad thing, the differences within the body of Christ end up being a good thing. Because his interests correlate to the interests of others, while my interests correlate to the interests of others, your interests correlate to the interests of somebody else. And as we are a diverse body, each of us has different experiences and a different background and different talents, gifts, and abilities. Some of them given by God, some of them natural things that are developed. Again, God allows that to develop. But we are to use those gifts, okay, for the glory of God for a specific purpose. And so the more diverse the church is, all right, the unity brings them together and the more effective the church is in being able to reach a diverse group of people. Think about this thought for just a second, okay? If we, as the church, have the same goal, bringing honor and glory to Christ, the more diverse we are, the better. Can you believe that? If we, as the church, have the same goal... The same focus, which is to bring honor and glory to Christ, the more diverse we are, the better. Because we can reach a greater diversity of people. Okay. So I want you to think a little bit further about this. Why is this so important? Because people are diverse, right? Diverse in their interests, abilities, backgrounds, experience. And if our job as the church is to reach those who are still lost without Christ we too are going to have to have some level of diversity. God already knew that, though, didn't he? God already understood that principle. And that's why he established the church the way that he did, using all sorts of different people to reach a widely diverse population of people. But you notice the key component is that God does it, not you or me. It's God that does this, not you or me. And that's what actually kills the pride in our lives. Allowing God to use us together as the church, each with our individual abilities, gifts, and interests. We are one body in Christ. And we are called to be devoted to the usage of our gifts for the glory of God. Look what Paul says in verse 6 of chapter 12. He says, having then gifts differing, different gifts, gifts differing, According to the grace that is given to us. By whom? By God. So, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, what are we supposed to do with them? Let us use them. Let us use them. And then Paul goes on to list various spiritual gifts. He says the gift of prophecy. Gift of prophecy literally means the proclamation of truth. It's not necessarily the foretelling of the future like we often think of when we hear prophecy. And so it's just the literal translation from Greek is the foretelling of truth. And sometimes it's simply the Bible has said that this will happen if, if this is your actions. And so the ability to foretell truth. And sometimes that is found in an evangelist, a preacher, a teacher type of setting, uh, that type of gift, the foretelling of truth. So prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, the showing of mercy. Now there's other spiritual gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. Um, some people say that those between all of this, that it's an exhaustive list. Others say that there are others that are not listed, that it's just examples of the types of giftings, wherever you fall on that. The point is that all of the spiritual giftings are, cre are given to work together okay, for a common cause, all right, which is to honor and glorify the Lord. That they're to be used within the context of the local church to bring unity and to destroy pride. To bring unity and to get rid of the pride of the individual, like I'm hot stuff. Nope. It's all the grace of God who has gifted, who has given us all things. It's the grace of God. And so, as we look at the spiritual gifts, the point today isn't really to explain them. 
All right, I'm not going to go through each of these and explain them. We actually do break those down in our new members class, uh, looking at the definitions, looking at how that they are used, and looking at the practical side. And so I think there's great importance in that. And so again, if you're new to the church, or even if you've been in the church a while but never gone through that class, uh, this is, is something good for you to look at. Um, but today, that's not, that's not the point. Um, the point is to see that whatever gift you have been given, that that gift is to honor the Lord and to use it consistently to build up His church. He wants you to use your gifts and abilities to build up his church. Okay? And it's here where we see the big idea of our message today. Again, if you don't get anything else, if you've slept up till now, okay, wake up for a second and jot a note, and then hopefully you can take this with you. All right? Here's the big idea for today. God's spiritual gift in your life, what God has given to you, God's spiritual gift in your life was given to you so that you would honor the Lord and use it consistently to build up his church. Okay? The gift that you have within you is given for you to consistently use that gift to build up the kingdom of God, to build up his church. So you might be asking yourself at this point, so Pastor Derek, how does this fit in with the concept of being devoted? Okay? Where he's, here's the deal. When we're focused Upon using the gifts that God has given to us for his honor, it first of all kills the pride in our lives because I'm acknowledging that it's of God, not of me, okay? and that's a good thing. And secondly, it gives us a path and a goal to faithfully pursue. As we realize that we have been gifted by God, sometimes in, in many different ways, and we see that, it gives us a pathway and a goal to faithfully pursue. Because you see, God doesn't want us to serve him with our giftings one day and then the next day go off the rails and ignore what he's given to us. <laughs> he wants us to consistently use those things. Okay? He wants us to be devoted to him by being devoted to the usage of his gifts in our lives for his glory. Does that make sense? He wants for us to stay consistent by actively, consistently using that which he's gifted us with. And did you notice that in all of this, it's never about me, outside of the fact that I'm the one who is to use those gifts, but it was given by God, because it's all about God. And when I am truly focused on Him, no matter what comes my way, the good, the bad, the, the spiritual high or the spiritual low, okay, if I am focused on using my giftings for God's glory, I remain consistent in my life. Because I have a purpose. I know what God has called me to, and I'm going to keep going. I'm going to continue to do that through the good and through the bad. And realize that my devotion to Christ is going to reflect back on him, giving him the honor and the glory that he deserves, that he is worthy of. So less of the roller coaster ride, okay? And more of the consistent walk. No more having my life determined by my circumstances. Focused, devoted to Christ hope that makes sense. I think the Apostle Paul is, is painting a, a, an amazing picture for us. He says, get rid of the pride. Understand that everything that you have and everything that you are is by the grace of God. And the grace that God has given to you is a gift. And then all the other giftings I'm going to give you, those things too should be used for my honor and my glory. And that will help you keep focused and get rid of that pride. Wow. So maybe some hope, hopefully some practical stuff today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your love for us, and I thank you for this passage of Scripture. Where Romans chapter 12 is very powerful in understanding, God, how you are changing and transforming us by working through the transformation of the mind, how you are bringing in truth, how you are helping us to combat uh, the lies of this world, how that we are not to be conformed to the lies of this world, but to be renewed by, by to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And to understand then, God, that you expect us to take the truth and to embrace that, to kill the pride in our lives and to embrace you and to understand humility and to see, God, that we are to serve you with everything that we are and everything that we have. That is our spiritual act of worship. Lord, I pray that you would help us over the next two weeks as we continue through this series, Lord, to be able to see the big picture and to see, God, how that you want our lives to be characterized by consistency, by a devotion uh, to Jesus uh, that, that is unshakable. Because when the world looks at us, God, that's what they desperately need to see. As our world becomes even more, ever more chaotic, Lord, 
they need to see something that is, that is steadfast and strong and secure. That Christians can be founded upon your word and that we can be unshakable, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And Lord, I pray for those that are here this morning, God, and they're just, they're struggling. They're in that roller coaster ride. God, I know I've been there. And, and God, maybe they're in the bottom right now and they're, they're just, they're, they're having difficulty. Lord, help them to see, God, that there can be consistency that's found in you and that you are their strength. And God, that you are calling them to live a life of devotion and a life of using everything that you have given to them for your honor and for your glory. And that the benefit of that, God, is our greatest good. Lord, I am thankful that, that you have given your son Jesus to die for us. And Lord, as we think about the, the effects of that, the forgiveness of sin, the purpose of life, Lord, we pray that we would honor that greatest of gifts. Lord, I'm thankful for what you're doing in my life, in my family, in my church. I'm thankful for what you are doing in our community. And Lord, I pray that you would give us an ever greater outreach and an ever greater love for those who are hurting Lord, sometimes it is very difficult to speak truth in the lives of others who have either rejected your truth already or, or don't understand it and, and, and just aren't coming through the doors of a church building. But help us to see, God, how that our lives need to intersect with those who are lost and without you. And the best thing that they can see is consistency. God, I'm thankful for what you're doing. Ask for strength for tomorrow and ask that all that we say and do would honor and glorify the name of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.